Welcome to everyone just joining us. We're going to give it a few moments to allow for everyone to join in. We had about 70 people in the waiting room, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. So we're going to allow everyone to come in slowly. All right. Well, in the interest of time, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Deirdre Young. I serve as a Chief Diversity Officer here at the College for Creative Studies. This is our first event for the term, and we're excited that all of you are able to join us today. We'll be recording this. As you all know, we will upload it on our DEI YouTube station, as well as it will go onto our uh, website, so you can always reference this if you need to. Um, so we're just very excited. Uh, for those who may not know me, I work here at CCS, uh, working in the Office of Institutional Equity and Inclusion. My pronouns are on the screen, she, her. Again, this is Deirdre talking. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dan Long. Dan serves as our Dean of Students, who's really gonna talk with our faculty and staff and students who are here around some processes and things to expect from the Office of Student Engagement. Dan. Thank you, Deirdre. As, uh, as Deirdre said, my name is Dan Long. I'm uh, the Dean of Students at the college. Uh, pronouns are he, him. Um, just as a very brief overview of the way accommodations work at CCS and most institutions of higher education, um, students are required to self-disclose um, that they have a disability um, or a medical condition that affects their life at uh, CCS. Um, this is primarily, we want to ensure that students are taking the power um, of disclosure or not disclosing a disability that they might have. Um, once they decide to come and talk to me about accommodations, we do require medical documentation from them substantiating that disability. Um, that can take a variety of forms. Um, IEPs from high school are often submitted. Documentation from doctors or therapists are often submitted. Um, but that is to establish, one, a diagnosis, um, two, symptoms that are relevant to the higher education and learning environment, um, and three, any sort of recommended accommodations that their treating doctor, therapist, counselor um, has for them in their academic environment. Um, the range of, of disabilities that are accommodated is, is physical, emotional, and, and, and mental disabilities. So many of them are things we will be discussing today in this presentation, neurodiversity, um, unseen disabilities, as they're often talked about, where you wouldn't necessarily know just by looking at a person that they have a, a disability. Um, once that documentation has been submitted, uh, the student and I meet one-on-one -on -one to determine what their accommodations are going to be at the college. Um, we do that in a, a collaborative way. We're, we're ensuring that the student is getting um, the type of accommodations that they're needing while also maintaining from the CCS perspective, curricular integrity um, and integrity for the learning outcomes in our, in our classes. Um, once we arrive at those accommodations, um, official notice is sent out to faculty on behalf of the student at the start of each semester. Those go out roughly a week before the semester starts um, so that they're early, but not too early so that people um, forget about them or, or don't see them over the course of a summer. Um, occasionally, we do have students that come in and disclose during the middle of the term, um, and we do put accommodations in place at that point, but we are not allowed to do any sort of retroactive accommodation. So it's only from the point of accommodations being established forward that we would put those in place. Um, as a faculty member, um, what you would receive from me is a very simple notice that just says a student is in, in your class. Um, that has a accommodations with the institution and those accommodations are, and I will just list a bullet point list of what those accommodations are. Um, I don't include students' diagnoses or symptoms or any personal information of that nature. Um, generally speaking, the accommodations are gonna be pretty straightforward and easy to follow. Um, but if you ever have questions about what those accommodations mean or how to implement them, I'm always happy to answer, answer those questions. Um, so that's a brief overview, and with that, I'll turn it over to Evan from the DEI office to introduce our speaker for the day. 
Hello, everybody. So today we have a wonderful speaker, Marenike Giwa Onaiwu. Um, and I'm going to read her bio real quick. Uh, Marenike was the first Black woman to chair the NIH-funded Global Community Advisory Board for HIV Clinical Research and the first Black Executive Board of Directors member of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. Marenike is the first public appointee of the in or Interagency Autism Coordinating Center, the U.S. Federal Advisory Committee on Autism, who is a Black self or Black autistic self advocate, parent, and professional. Marenike has also previously led and or served in a leadership capacity in roles funded by networks sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and Health Resources and Services Information Administration. So please. Uh, help us welcome um, Marena K. Giwa Anaiwu as they discuss autism, neurodiversity, intersection, and intersectionality in the workplace. Take it away. Thank you so much, Evan. And hello, everyone. Um, I, my name is Marena K. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. And I'm going to be presenting to you and for as an accommodation to myself, um, I'm going to turn my video off once I share the screen so that I can concentrate, but I will turn the video back on for Q&A. And so thank you for being here. If you give me just a moment to get my screen situated and my camera off. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. So um, this is a presentation for your DEI series. I am Marenike. Actually, let me hide this little bar because it probably doesn't look too nice. <laughs> And so I just want to thank you for being here today in this virtual environment, which is our new reality. And so I know that um, it's funny. I have this picture of a dog here because I was uh, essentially talking about sometimes some people are commuting, working from home or, you know, some days maybe on campus, other days. Um, and, you know, you might be at home and your fur babies think if you're home, it's time to play, you know, or your real babies if you have those. Um, what's funny is this morning, um, I had a, a bit of a debacle with my neighbors for baby. <laughs> So um, it just, it's like an inside joke, but at any rate, I, how, wherever you are, if you're sitting at a desk on campus, if you're in your home, if you're in your vehicle, if you're in a classroom, I, um, I just really appreciate you being here with us. Um, just quickly, um, I like to give, um, um, when I'm doing presentations because of the content, I like to give um, content and trigger warnings just to be safe um, in talking about things such as um, neurodiversity and intersectionality and um, things in the workplace, there are some things that I have to share related to you know, discrimination and some statistics that or you know, general anecdotal information that people might find harmful talking about disability discrimination and other forms of discrimination with other marginalizations. And I just ask that you, um, you know, practice self-care. I also um, want to share that my presentations are heavily image-based. And so um, if you happen to need image descriptions, there's contact information for my staff that I can give you at the end. I start off all of my presentations with what I call my five C's of accessibility. Um, I'll go through them quickly because I do want to ensure that we have time for discussion and Q&A at the end. Um, I do just want to mention them, though. Um, so my first C stands for comfort. I want you to be comfortable. And so that is part of the reason I turn my camera off so that I can focus while I'm present presenting. I'm also sitting on the floor in my living room which, where it has natural light and wearing, and I have some stimming devices on my fingers to help me. So whatever it is, you're my you know, guests in my figurative home for the next 45 minutes to an hour. So I want you to be comfortable to move. Um, if you need to grab something to drink, whatever it is that you need to do so that you can um, pay better attention because a um, an engaged learner is, um, you know, is an active learner. And building on that, I'd like, you know, this next C is for connect. Um, so if there's things that you want to look up, 
online, take notes. If you want to participate, um, whatever it is that you can do to ensure that this is meaningful, this is not just kind of passively, um, you know, information that's just washing over you, but that you are, you know, a, a connected part of this dialogue that we're having. Consideration of my next C, I want everyone to be considerate because none of us have the same background. None of us have the same level of understanding. None of us know all the same acronyms. Um, please try to assume that people are coming from a place of good intentions. I know that intent, you know, often, you know, can have a, a greater um, effect than our intent, but let's try to be considerate of one another. Um, if a person needs to time to communicate, if they're using the, the typing feature, if they're using an assistant, um, if there's a speech impediment or just a need for more clarification, let's um, be a community about it. And then, so my last two C's are usually challenge and commit. And that's why I have them together because I feel like they go hand in hand in terms of challenging yourself to keep growing and learning because there's never a day that we're alive in this classroom of life that we can't gain and improve on something, no matter um, what, um, experience we have, whether no matter what education we have, um, no matter what we've seen or been through, there's always new things to learn or ways to solidify or emphasize the knowledge that we have. And we need to, um, knowing that, we need to commit to continuing to be a lifelong learner who grows, changes, and sees um, those things as positive as not, and not as something that we should be concerned about. So talking about autism, neurodiversity, intersectionality, all of those things in the workplace, um, these are important points. And so um, I want to just kind of go over some sh foundational um, um, concepts to make sure that we're all in the same place and that we all understand together. I don't like to make assumptions, um, but before doing so, I just want to kind of quickly share a little bit of trivia in that in a presentation of this type, um, by the time we're done, there will have been enough um, oil used, you know, basically, you know, fossil fuels to fill almost 200 Olympic sized swimming pools. Approximately 7,000 people will wed their partner or spouse. During this time, a, a, a horse foal will be born and learn how to walk. And you will probably blink about 1,200 times. So just a little interesting factoid for you. Now, so we're going to talk about a couple of concepts, and the first concept that I want to talk about is that of, um, you know, identity. So every single human being has multiple identities. There is no person who is just homogeneous. You have various different aspects of who you are, from your age, to your gender, to your race, your ethnicity your country of origin, are you left-handed or right-handed, your, you know, interests, your political, you know, affiliations, all types of things. We have multiple different layers, just like onions do. Um, and all, everything about us is cannot be seen. Some aspects of who we are um, may, may not, may be hidden or may not be as noticeable, but it is true that we are a sum of, of our parts. We are not just one thing. So someone can see one aspect of us, but there are many things that make us who we are and they all influence our lives and all of those things we have some areas of advantage in those areas and also some areas of disadvantage in that, no matter who we are um, however when we're looking at the concept of intersectionality it's a little bit different than that of multiple identities so again we all have multiple identities and um, this term which is used quite a bit and it's, it's often misused actually because people seem to conflate intersectionality and diversity and they're both important but they're not the same you know, so whereas diversity is having a range of views or experiences or, um, you know, individuals or, you know, of different types, um, that's very important. And that's something that we all need, but intersectionality takes it a little further. And it's not just talking about the fact that we have these multiple identities, because we all do, but it's talking about the fact that when we look at society, um, these identities are not created equal. So, um, you know, even the ones that are social constructs, which are a lot of them, um, we still need to have this lens. And Dr. Kimberlake Crenshaw um, uh, basically came up with this term. Um, we need to have this lens of understanding that our unique experiences are in flux and they vary. Um, and so they, you know, as they overlap with one another, the term intersectionality is used to kind of think about intersections crossing against across one another, um, flowing in every direction. It's not about um, shaming anyone, or it's just about looking at the different 
aspects of these categories of who we are and how they um, interact with social with society. Um, they're constantly shaping and uh, you know moving and shaping at all times, and they're not siloed. And so, one example you know that I can give um, of intersectionality is um, I'm there's a, a a colleague of mine named um, Nico. Nico is um, a white middle class um, heterosexual cisgender male. Um, um, but Nico is also disabled. So he has that, you know, as um, so though he might have some identities that may appear, and he has many other identities beyond those. He's an artist, he's a writer. Um, so there's many things I could share about him, you know, in that capacity as well. But um, you know, that are who he is. But in terms of he has some identities where there is privilege attached to them. And privilege isn't anything we asked for, begged for, stole from anyone. It's something that's kind of attributed to us by, you know by default, really not by anything that we we did. So while he has some um, identities that are considered privileged, he also has marginalizations. Being a disabled person in a world where disability is not you know, seen as the greatest thing. Furthermore, um, we are both on the autism spectrum, Nico and I, but I am an individual who is able to speak. I am speaking to you now, whereas Nico can make some vocalizations with his mouth um, and can repeat some things, but typically cannot speak with his mouth. He types to communicate or points at a letter board. Um, he is not able to um, communicate in the conventional way with a lot of people. And though he has a lot to say, um, it takes longer and some people um, are impatient or think that he doesn't have anything to share at all. Or maybe while he's pointing or typing, he's also stimming and moving in a way with, you know, that makes people think, oh, well, he doesn't really know what's going on. And so he gets discriminated against quite a bit. So in this case, we're looking at his different identities um, you know, some of the privilege that he might have because of his um, gender or race, um, he also is discriminated against because of these other factors. And so therefore, um, his experiences are different than that of someone who has a different life than his. And so all of this is important because um, when we take, when we look at the concept of neurodiversity overall, it, it, it's something that um, is really a reality for all of us. And so the concept, neurodiversity is used all the time and people typically use it when they're thinking about autism and ADHD, but there, neurodiversity is so much more than that. So when Judy Singer coined the term, this is an um, Australian sociologist in the late nineties, it was really supposed to be kind of like the developmental equivalent of the 95 theses um, or of the Declaration of Independence, is looking dependence essentially. It was basically the fact that neurodiversity, which is a play on neurological biodiversity or diversity is just like biodiversity. We have the heterogeneity of different species that makes up life. Neurodiversity is a natural, normal form of, of diversity. Um, there are different hierarchies of normalcy um, and dynamics in the world that we see, just like we see with, you know, for example, social classes or races or religion. None are the same. They're all different from one another, but there are some that are perhaps more common and therefore the world is more suited for them. So neurodiversity is everyone. A person, so um, it, approximately 90% um, of the population of the world is right-handed. Um, only approximately 10% are left-handed and or am ambidextrous. So most people are right-handed. So they're predominantly right-handedness. And so things such as scissors and other things are, or handshakes even are, um, you know, arm wrestling, you know, things, games are often the uh, people default to the right hand. Similarly, when people process or think in a way that's similar to others, even though there's still differences, their way of thinking or processing, communicating, et cetera, is considered more neurotypical, more within the, the bell curve, you know, within the, 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 the groupings that you'll find of most people. And so even though two people who are quote unquote neurotypical, are different than one another. Just like we don't have the same fingerprints as even an identical twin, um, two people who are neurotypical have different brains from one another, but perhaps they can communicate and understand one another more easily than they can with someone who is neurodivergent. So someone who um, has dyslexia or dyscalculia or ADHD or giftedness or intellectual disability or any number of things. And so um, neurodiversity, um, you know, those who are, of us who are um, neurominorities basically are from, you know, neurological groups that are less, that are not as, as prevalent in the population, though there are a lot of them. And so interestingly enough, 
um, I mentioned neurodiversity is a term that was intended to kind of describe, you know, neurotypicality, you know, versus neurodivergence. Um, and it was coined by Judy Singer, but um, a, um, a woman of color, um, Cassiana Sasamas, um, built, uh, created neurodivergence um, as a concept to build on that, to look at the fact that some people might be born with these neurological differences or with developmental differences with their IQ or what have you, but there's also acquired neurodivergence, um, such as traumatic brain injury, such as the cognitive changes you have with long COVID, such as a number of things that can, can um, change things that um, the way a person um, views things and identifies. And so it's looking at whether it's inherent, whether it's acquired, whether it's in childhood or in adult, is kind of a more umbrella term. And um, Shane Niemeyer is a an aut autistic activist and an attorney who made an uh, who has an interesting point about neurodiversity that I like to share. Because a lot of times people think it means oh, it means it's just a difference. It's not a disability. It's a superpower. You know, humans have their own ways of viewing or saying or thinking things. But um, and they and there's certainly variation. But neurodiversity is self that does not address it because it is not a list as Shane says it is not a list of words or slogans for people to use or, or avoid it's a movement with the ultimate goal of social justice vindicating the inherent worth of everyone and everyone's right to enjoy inclusion freedom and supports that allow for both of those things regardless of neurology and so neurodiversity promotes acceptance. And so the point of neurodiversity is we, people pathologize difference. It's, you know, instead of saying that something is different, they say that it's bad. And they may say that they mean different, but they mean bad. And I can give an example simply by giving you the name of a few of my diagnoses. I am diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Disorder is not a neutral term. It's a, you know not in order. I am diagnosed with... Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, not condition, not diagnosis, not way of thinking, you know, and if you think about these labels, you know, if you think about even the, if you look at the DSM-4, DSM-5, the ICD, and you read the criteria for some of these diagnoses, you know, um, in, um, you know, repetitive, you know, restrictive of uh, this or deficient this or abnormal this, you know, so not neutral terms. And, you know, and so it, it, it begs to differ are we, you know, we're saying again that this is a difference, but our world, you know, the social model of disability talks about how things that are disabling in society um, can create uh, dis disabilities for us. Disabilities also exist on their own, you know, such as an interactionist model, but um, we can, we can um, exacerbate that through the, the policies that we have. Um, by the way that we treat others. And so, you know, intersectionality is a reality for everyone. It impacts all of us. It's not a new philosophy. It's something that's been around for a long time. If you're familiar with things such as um, Sojourner Truth's anti-woman speech, she's um, kind of deconstructing femininity and race and social class and, and some of the thoughts, you know, of at that time that existed about the different categories. So our understanding of these things is limited, which is why we need one another. Um, and so we, I want to quickly um, go into a couple of misconceptions that people have about some of these concepts, and I'm going to use autism as um, kind of the base example. And so um, it's very interesting because we, we know a lot more about autism than we did before, but we're still learning. And um, I, you know, my older brother attended an HBCU, which is a historically black college or university, and um, they would bring in lecturers for different you know, events. And so when, you know, when he went to an, an environmental science lecture, they brought in someone who worked in that field, you know, who, when they, when he went to a lecture on, you know, um, studio art, you know, they brought in someone who was an artist. When they had something for Women's Heritage Month, they brought in someone who worked in women's studies, they brought in women to share their experiences, et cetera. Um, and that's that lived and learned expertise is valued in a lot of places, but not in autism. Autism is a place where you will you're fortunate if you find anyone with lived experience to be present. It's something that people believe um, happens to children. And yes, because every all of us became we're children at one point. We're born, we grow, we die. 
And so, yes, it is something that is present because it's neurological, it's a developmental, um, you know, condition. It's, it's present in children, but it's also present in adulthood. People may not understand or recognize it, or individuals may feel maybe hidden from society because of stigma or, or because of lack of services, or they might camouflage. But it is something that occurs across the lifespan. Um, it isn't a disease. It's a disability. Some people may not consider themselves disabled, and no one has to accept any particular identity for themselves if they do not want to. They have a right to call themselves what they want. But in and of itself, it's a condition, a difference that has, you know, strengths and it has areas where they also are, need accommodation. There is not a cure for it unless you kill us. You know, that is a cure, but it does not disappear. Um, there are things that can be done. There are a lot of um, treatments, interventions, um, many of which are compliance-based, which might reduce the appearance of it, but it's still there. Um, just like um, I, um, I have the texture of hair that is called 4C hair. It's kind of like um, thick, um, um, thick, kinky, like Afro textured hair. I can put a relaxer on my hair and it will straighten. But as soon as I grow some more hair at the roots, they're curly again. I'm gonna to have to straighten, put some more relaxer on it or blow dry it or something to make it straight again. I've never changed the hair that, the texture of the hair that grew out of my scalp. I'm only changing its appearance. Um, there's also thoughts that we have no empathy. And this is often because I think people take um, tests of theory of mind and they look at, they mix up affective and cognitive empathy and um, feel that if you cannot put yourselves in quote unquote someone else's shoes, then you cannot relate. And so while research does show that um, cognitive empathy is a challenge for a lot of people who are autistic and neurodivergent, um, effective empathy is actually um, typically higher than that of others. And that's why sometimes um, emotions can be, we can, one can be flooded with emotions or can be even, or even shut them down because of how deeply one might feel for others' pain or circumstances or what have you, even if we can't quote unquote relate um, or see ourselves in their lives. There's also misconceptions about high and low, and these are arbitrary. While people are different, humans are different, absolutely. Um, autism is a spectrum. Um, Dr. Stephen Shore says, if you've met one person on the autism spectrum, you've met one person on the autism spectrum. So while people are different, I'm different than my autistic son, than my autistic daughter, than my autistic mother, um, there isn't a higher low because no one wants to be called low, you know, and there's no um, severe and mild because human beings are not sauce. We have, you know, variations. Um, and so instead of calling someone low functioning, um, it would be better to explain the traits that you see in that individual. And it's, it's too subjective. And you can think about there are terms in certain communities. Um, a person can say such and such is light skinned. But maybe the perception to someone else is that person is dark skinned, you know, so it's it's relative who is light, quote unquote, who is dark. Um, it all depends on what you're comparing it to. And so um, we uh, we do not see the life or the circumstances of um, neurotypicality as being the norm, the standard that we have to measure ourselves against. And so instead of saying someone's high functioning or low functioning, one could say, oh, well, this individual has high support needs. This individual, you know, um, is non-speaking. They have a lot of self non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. They have a full-time aid. Um, they have seizures quite a bit. Um, they have, you know, some cognitive challenges, or this person is a speaking individual who needs some support in these areas or what have you. It would make a lot more sense because I could tell you, hey, there's a black guy in that room, but um, it could be Terrence Howard in that room. It could be Michael Jordan in that room. It could be, um, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people and, they, and I can't tell you, you know, with, without more description, I'm not telling you who I'm looking for, who I'm finding. And so all of these concepts really, do, you know, the, the overarching, the umbrella concept of all for that is for all of these, uh, that neurodiversity, autism, intersectionality all fall in is the concept of disability justice. And so this is a larger um, framework and it's one that has 10 principles and it talks about things such as um, interdependence that all human beings um, need and rely upon one another. We're all interconnected in one way or another. Um, it talks about the fact that, you know, it asserts that all of the different things that make us who we are, um, are, you know, are matter. So our experiences, our gender, our race, the different, the other movements, the things that have nothing to do with disability, but are part of our lives. Um, and that we 
should have solidarity and care about these other causes and other people, that people are more than what they can produce and what they can give. So it isn't about how much um, education a person has acquired or how much they earn. So all of these different concepts basically about, you know, basically about looking at people holistically and valuing them um, as a whole is, some, is something that we can all aspire to. Um, because when we don't, we have discrimination. And so we have a great deal of that in the workplace, in the school setting, in society at large, um, where there's negativity um, that is attributed to um, individuals who are different. And so I can give you a couple of um, examples, unfortunately. So if we look at um, disability, um, individuals who are disabled, and we, I can specifically, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm talking about disability overall cross disability, but I want you to also know that all of these, um, this information um, tracks as well for um, neurodevelopmental disability and for autism. So um, our um, individuals are less likely to graduate high school, have a disproportionate number of um, school punishment and suspension and have less um, accommodations in society as well. Um, there is a higher number um, um, autistic children are 2.5 times more likely to be, um, you know, to have, um, to be, um, to have child abuse, you know, suspected child abuse in their home um, from the ages of birth to five, to eight than um, children without, who are not autistic. A third of the time, um, child protective services does not follow up on or, um, you know, basically investigate the cases. It's often seen as, oh, well, it's written off as autism. The child is hard to deal with. So uh, therefore true, you know, um, abuse or neglect is often missed. Um, there's lower entrepreneurship, um, home ownership, and employment overall. Um, more persistent poverty, where um, you know it's actually where one dwells in poverty for over 24 months. Um, the suicide rate is between 10.9 and 50 percent higher than that of um, one's peers. Um, specifically, um, children with autism have a 14 percent um, rate of suicide um, compared to developing um, children who it's between zero and Five percent um, suicide is one of the top three causes of premature mortality in individuals on the autism spectrum, which is why, depending on whose statistics you read, the um, lifespan, expected lifespan of some autistic individuals can be in the mid thirties. There's some research now saying early fifties, but it's quick, significantly um, less than that of our peers. We're nine times more likely than those without autism um, to die of suicide. We're seven times more likely to have um, in, in experiences that are less than positive with the police, um, we, with law enforcement. Um, we are three times more likely to die of an injury than other people, um, whether it's drowning or a vehicle accident or what have you. Um, our, if you're a gender minority or a person who is autistic and um, assigned female at birth or non-binary, have a, a much higher rate, possibly um, in some statistic in some research, four times higher rate of um, being a, a, of sexual assault um, and um, I mean, four to six times higher um, cognitive word deficits, you know, are, are perceived differently in us. So often we have to appear to have more impairment to get just to be viewed, just to be seen. So whether this is in the school setting, the fact that we um, graduate a lot less, you know, there are 11% of colleges in the universe in, in universities in the United States and its territories report having zero people with disabilities. That's really scary when you think about that. And only approximately 25% of individuals who have disabilities in college say that they feel that um, are um, getting adequate accommodations. Um, I know many are not um, getting them or feeling comfortable asking for them. Um, there are, and, and hence the rate of graduation, you know, is so much lower. We, our persistence rate, you know, um, is so much lower than that of other people. We drop out, we don't finish as quickly. Um, are as likely as our, as our peers, even when you look at, um, even when you extend a degree to, to, from four years to six years. Um, there are, it is still legal today, right now, in this moment, um, to use electric shock as a treatment. And I don't mean electric shock like ECT, I mean graduated electric devices. I mean, putting nodes on one's chest and buttocks and legs and arms and wearing a backpack that someone can um, press a button and elicit shock 
that is, you know, throughout your body um, for not greeting them or for, you know, not making eye contact or what have you from, um, and this is, this is paid for by taxpayer dollars, um, children um, as young as eight years old, as well as adults, mostly of color um, at, um, and the FDA um, has, is looking into this case, but it's still in the Judge Roddenberg Center still exists today. Um, the terminology that we use, if you look at peer-reviewed literature, uh, you know, you'll view terms where it says something about, you know, symptoms. If you Google autism, people will tell you about red flags, about warning signs, and all of these things. You know, sometimes people talk about how someone is suffering. You know, there are statistics about how much autism costs, about how, you um, you um, the divorce rate of parents or the stress rate. And while in no, nothing in life is all roses and unicorns, um, someone suffering from autism is not, again, is a loaded term. That's quite different than saying someone's on the spectrum, someone has autism or is a person with autism or is an autistic person. Um, we don't, you know, we, if you think about, um, no one describes themselves as, if someone, if you said to someone, that they are a professor or they are a teacher or a coach, they wouldn't say, no, I'm not, don't label me because those are positive terms. But when you, when the label is considered negative um, because of the stigma in society, people do bristle against them. And so we end up with these circumstances that are far from ideal. Um, we end up with people having isolating experiences in the workplace. We end up with people who have um, late diagnoses um, in a lot of cases. We end up with people who um, have co-occurring health conditions that are not properly addressed and so forth. These are not single issues. Um, we don't live single issues lives. And so all of these things are, impact us. And so I'm gonna show a quick video, it's about two minutes or so. And then I'm just gonna wrap up with a few slides and then hopefully open it up for dialogue about some things that we can do, you know, that can be done by others who are allies. Cause the onus should not be upon only the individual with the condition um, to advocate for themselves at all times. Um, I apologize in advance if there's any um, YouTube commercials. <laughs> Hopefully not, but you never know. This is What's Lumen, there? the first device for hacking your metabolism. With just one breath, Lumen. I'm going to pause for a moment. Carly Fleischman is a young adult um, who um, is a twin. She has a, a sister named Taryn and then herself. And so this is a video that she created with the assistance of her sister and her father sharing the experience that she had one day in, in a cafe one afternoon. Um, so I'm just trying to show this so that you can kind of understand her, the way life can be. Um, she's with people who love, accept her, care about her, and yet still um, there's so much going on in her circumstances that make things challenging and that make things difficult. And so this is something that I want people to understand because just like when we're talking about racism, the person who's wearing the white hood and burning crosses in, in one's yard is not who you will typically come across. There's more insidious microaggressions and you know systemic problems. Similarly, this the ableism and the lack of accommodation that we face is not people saying, I hate autism, you suck, you're terrible, but it's in the way that things are structured and the way that we are treated and the way that we are, are viewed um, or misunderstood. And so um, Carly is a non-speaking individual and has um, also has anxiety, so has um, stims, sometimes aggression that she doesn't like, that she doesn't want. She's able to communicate through typing and through an iPad, but this is an example of an, of an afternoon out she had just so you can see kind of what it was like for her. Hmm, I can't wait for a coffee. Oh, hello, barista. What do you girls want? Um, skin soy latte. <laughs> Taryn, soy can't be skim. Hot chocolate, orange juice. No, Dad, I want a coffee. Hot chocolate? Great. So I was thinking of going to Sarah's later. Could you give me a ride? Yeah, sure. Are you cool with taking your sister? Yeah. Wait. What? I have my own plan. Carly. Okay, I'll see you tonight, okay?
I like showing the um, Carly's video because of the fact that it's just so interesting when you think about like, you know, potential. So Carly um, was thought to be intellectually disabled for a long time because she did not develop at the same rate as her twin sister um, who was seen in the video. She did not, you know, in terms of developmental milestones, she did not, did not meet them at the same time as her sister. She was not um, communicating conventionally. She um, you know, did not sleep as much. And so she was perceived to have intellectual disability. And so for years was in a segregated classroom where they were trying to teach her primary colors and numbers um, without knowing the fact that, that she had taught herself how to read and was doing advanced mathematics, um, but just couldn't communicate that to anyone. So she appeared to have little expressive um, understanding, um, expressive or receptive understanding, but she, but that was not the case. And so she, the only reason they discovered that she had more awareness is one day she was having so much pain that she grabbed an AIDS um, phone or and typed teeth hurt, need dentist. And they were shocked. They didn't even know she understood what those things mean. So over time, this is a set Thing where you see how the, the lighting is fuzzy. So just living life, just the things that people take for granted um, can be so challenging when you are different. So she walks into this coffee shop. There's the chiming of the bell every time it comes in. There's the sounds of the water. There's the sounds of the coffee. There's the smells of it. There's all the chatter around you. There's you know all of these things that she's having to contend with, maybe the temperature. And you're having to try to be still and be okay in this environment that may be physically uncomfortable. Um, then you aren't able to express what you want. So you want one thing, you're given another, um, and people are looking at you. And so when Carly starts humming to try to calm herself down, people start staring and she's kind of getting flustered. Her father makes plans for her as if, you know, talking about her as if, you know, she's not there, like she's an appendage or like she just needs to be dragged along. And then um, she, when she finally um, gets flustered and knocks over the, the hot chocolate that she never wanted and didn't ask for, and almost gets what she wanted, reaches for the coffee, which is what she wanted, um, that is taken away. <laughs> and so it's it's like, people aren't helping you, but when you try to help yourself because you're not doing so in a conventional way, you're viewed as difficult, challenging, hard to deal with. Um, and so this, we really need to look at human beings differently. We need to think about the fact that, you know, when you think about energy, you have potential and kinetic energy. You have energy that's in motion and we have energy that's at rest, but has the ability, the capacity um, to, um, to be, you know, to do so much. And so essentially that's what a lot of, when we look at, you know, that's how we need to view individuals and their differences, their, you know, whether it's disability, whether it's race, whether it's gender, we need to think about the potential and not just what we see on the surface. And so um, giving an example of myself, um, I grew up and I was undiagnosed for a lot of my life. Um, I, there was always difference. Everybody knew I was different. Um, and so when I was young, I was tested. They found out I, you know, had, my, I was gifted, qualified for Mensa. And so they thought, okay, that's it. And all the kids in the gifted classes were off, were kind of, you know, quirky and weird. So for a long time, I think that held. And then the fact that I was um, one of few people of color in a lot of the classes that I had and, or, or, you know, assigned female at birth, I think a lot of things were missed that people didn't really understand. And so I learned very early that who I was and what I was and the way I was wasn't acceptable to the world and that I needed to hide it and I needed to learn to be some other way. I would spend hours in the mirror practicing how to move, how to speak. Um, trying to remember things that I heard people say or things, you know, that others did, um, suppressing every single thing that I felt or did because it was wrong and learning the proper script or flow chart for each different situation. And then falling apart essentially because of the amount of, you know, of energy and emotional labor, the exhaustion of having to be this way. And so um, in adulthood, um, I've started to claim some of these things back to myself, you know, so I carry things, this is an image of my backpack on the left. Um, and I carry things like I'm not always able to speak. And so I'm not going to just pretend now like that I can. I have, you know, communication devices. I bring stimming devices with me. I bring earplugs so I won't be overwhelmed by sound. Um, in my, you obviously can't bring a backpack with you everywhere. So on the far right, this is a purse. This is a very small wallet purse because of executive functioning. I lose things. So I have what can fit in a small sandwich or snack bag. I have lip gloss. I've got communication badges, a very small cush ball. I've got earplugs that are wrapped up in that tissue. Um, I've got, um, you know, 
lip moisturizer because having a dry lip can, you know, be very, very uncomfortable for me and can, you know, create sensory, dis, you know, dysregulation. So these are things that I bring with me as an adult. Um, so, you know, when just like people, people bring their phones, you bring your phone charger or you bring the things that you need. If you, if you're going out, if you have a baby, you pack your diapers and you pack your wipes and your baby bag and you change of clothes, you prepare. Um, are we as a, as a society, as colleagues, as friends, family in the workplace, how have we prepared for those who are neurodivergent? For those who are who have intersectional identities, how are they represented in the literature that we have, in the um, examples that we give in our uh, manuals, in the languaging, in the way that we structure our events, our meetings, our expectations? Do we implement universal design? Because really, there's a lot of things that might be needed or helpful for one group that can also be helpful for another. Um, captioning, for example, was initially designed to be something that was an aid for those who are visually impaired or, or I'm sorry, who are hearing impaired or, or deaf or hard of hearing. But for a number of people, captioning is great if you, English is your second language or if you're a multimodal learner or it, for a number of different reasons, you don't auditory, auditory processing. It can be very helpful. Ramps, help people who are, use wheelchairs, but also people who use canes and also people who are pushing a stroller. A lot of these things, if we design things to where they can be used by the greatest amount of people um, with the least amount of modification, that's the better way. Um, everyone can go up a ramp. Everyone cannot go up the stairs. You know, and so essentially we need to look at these things as justice. Um, when you have a meeting, you know, are you sending reminders? Do you give people more ways to communicate than just having to speak in the meeting? Can they chat? Can they email you afterward? Can they ask questions? Did you share the agenda in writing? Did you share it ahead of time? Um, did you give people, um, do people have to set up accommodations every time they need something? Do they need to remember about 48 hours in advance to call this number or to email this person or to ask for this? Do they need to find all this paperwork and every time they need something so they can prove who they are? Do they need to disclose things about themselves that are personal um, so that they can be given a uh, a, a cubicle that's not right near an air conditioning vent that's too cold or too loud or right by the elevator with the pinging or so they can wear sunglasses because the fluorescent light hurts or so they can wear um, not have to socialize at the holiday party or what have you. How are we changing things? Um, my doctoral program, I was derailed from, from, I got my doctorate about three years later than I was supposed to because the initial program that I was enrolled in, we had projectors um, like these, you know, that they used in the room that after, even after they were turned off, they would continue to buzz and hum at a low volume the entire period of a class, an evening class that was five hours long. Um, so many times I had to leave class in tears because I could not function. No one else could hear it after a few minutes, their ears adjusted, but mine never did. And so essentially we need to look, some of us have, we, we, we have different brains than one another. We have different capacity. I have um, a child that's, um, two, two children actually that are gifted. I've got a child with intellectual disability. I've got children with um, average intelligence. Their brains um, are not the same, but they are humans and they, their hearts matter, their souls matter. And so whether we're looking at um, the color of a person's skin, the language they speak, who they love or don't love, how much they earn, what you know, you know, their citizenship is. These things should be viewed in a way that are different, but that different, again, one does not weigh more than another. There should be an equivalency and equity in that we try to, we care for, view, and address these things, all of these things for all of us. So there's a number of ways that we can do this. We can um, educate ourselves because allyship is not an identity. It's a process, uh, a lifelong process. Um, it's not self-defined. So we can actively acknowledge our privilege and power and discuss it, listen and learn, um, work with, with integrity, um, build our capacity to be able to receive criticism from others, embrace the emotions that we have and realize that our needs are secondary. Um, you know, like it's the, you know, our needs are important, but our individual needs might, we need to look at the access needs of all, the self-care of all, and, you know, basically use our privilege to call attention to these things, even if we don't need them, um, but be an ally in terms of the action 
um, practice it by um, making sure that we have improved access to to meetings and to actions that we're that we're making that we're not just making assumptions. We're leaving room for new thoughts, new ways of doing things. Um, we're thinking about who we're leaving behind, and we're um, providing multiple ways for people to be involved and to matter. And so um, my uh, website is Marena K G O. Like, or, like go, like go away. If you need um, to reach me by any means, my um, this is staff at advocacywithoutborders.org. And on social media, I'm at Marena K G O. Like, um, more Nike um, go. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I'm hoping. I apologize. I think I went a bit over, and so I don't know if we'll have as much time as we wanted for question and discussion. But I do hope we still have some. I think you're muted, Evan. I am. <laughs> we do have time. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Marina Kay? Please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to input questions. Thank you. And or while we wait, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that information while we wait. Uh, the statistics, everything was just mind blowing. And thank you for personalizing uh, it in so many ways. I see, thank you, this was great from Tracy Muscat, our Vice President of Institutional Advancement. Um, Evan, feel free to read uh, comments in Q&A. Uh, yes, I see one from Andrea, I believe. I hope I'm pronouncing it um, correctly, Fredrickson. I'm curious about your thoughts on how a capitalist system influences how we view people, especially in terms of production equals value. and Oh my goodness, this is such a wonderful um, point um, because I think that it, it has a great deal to do with that. Because like when you look even in the in at the hierarchies in disability, like sometimes people will say something like, well, I use a wheelchair, but my brain is fine. Or okay, so I'm kind of socially awkward, but I mean I'm I'm smart. I'm, you know, like, you know, even in terms of the, the things that we use, like high and low functioning, it's about ranking people, you know, and in terms of, you know, and it makes me think about, you know, that if you look at the caste system or if you look at colorism, it's about someone being higher, someone being lower, and equip uh, you know, equating what they can bring to the table um, to what their value is. Like I, you know, I have graduate degrees and whatnot, but I'm, I'm just as valuable a person if I say, if I play video games all day, because I'm, you know, I'm a, who, what am I bringing into society as a whole? It shouldn't be about just production. And I think that that's one of the key um, elements of disability justice is um, that it's not, it, you know, it does not, and I know that's something that organizations may struggle with, you know, it's, it's, it does not promote capitalism and it promotes more of a communal, you know, kind of way of understanding people's value or contributions beyond just income. Um, and, um, and there is someone who mentioned that they were, um, they are also neurodivergent and they appreciate, um, us, you know, talking about these things and thank you very much, um, for that. Um, and if anyone has comments to share, anything you'd like to share, doesn't necessarily have to be a question, anything that people would benefit from you sharing, typing or saying, or, you know, or if you'd like to use the raise hand feature, please feel free to. I do want to say that one thing that I've noticed is like, you know, creative, um, you know, this is College for Creative Studies. So places that I, I found that a lot of like non-traditional types of programs are often, you know, kind of places that intrinsically <laughs> might provide a more of a haven for those of us who are different already kind of utilizes, you know, kind of like unconventional thinking or, or patterns or, you know, you know, or uh, ways of viewing things already, you know, in a way that's non-traditional. And so in some ways, those can be a, a great place where you can build, you know, and, and build on the, on the foundation that is there to uh, kind of just take it a step further and um, make it more accommodating or accessible for everyone. Um, I see that Mary has said, my grandson is 21, autistic in college and working and driving. Are there places um, or resources or groups where he can go to meet other people or would you be, or who would be accepting or like you said, a haven? And I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think that it does become challenging because there's so much focus on youth 
um, we know we don't stay children forever. We're adults more of our lives than we are children. And so um, when it's very difficult, and I think we've all seen that since the pandemic, when, you know, society, like the way that we socialize has changed and it's challenging in general for people to make, you know, to make acquaintances or to understand or get to know one another. And so um, it is important for, um, for people to have places where they can be around others. So I, I would really encourage if there are, if he has interests, like if he's a gay Gamer, you know, or if he's into cosplay, um, there's a lot of community that you can find from people who are interested in some of the same things that you are. Um, and so sometimes a lot of times these, you can, you, these online, you know, settings can develop, you know, once you obviously one wants to use, be, you know, use scrutiny, um, but can, you can form friendships, you know, with others in that capacity. Um, there are conferences, um, there is one called Autistics Presents that is held every October. Um, and I believe if he's a college student, I believe it will be free for him. It's a virtual, it used to be in person, but now it's a hybrid conference. It's um, Bellevue, Washington. And it's, um, so there would be a number of people that he could meet from all around the country um, that he could connect with um, in, in that capacity too. So it can be hard. And I think that a lot of things, a lot of the social skills training that we are given makes it even makes us even more nervous and confused and and awkward to meet people because now we're trying to police ourselves. So it can be very challenging. And so I think that when, if he's comfortable in himself, which no one's perfect, and, and he's comfortable in the thing that he's doing, it will allow him to hopefully find, you know, his find his people. And, and they may have age differences, you know, and that's something I notice a lot in the autistic community. There could be someone who's in their 20s and they're friends with someone who's 17 or 45, you know, often the, the age that our peers are not necessarily in our age range. Um, and there is also a point about neurodivergency is less obvious and it often skipped in efforts to accommodate. Um, oh, okay, Mary, great. I'm glad to hear it. Yes, yeah, it's, it's called Autistics Present in Bellevue, Washington. And they have a, you know, it's a great um, conference. I believe this will be the seventh year. And so um, it's just a really great way to connect. When they used to have it in person, all of us called it the Autistic Family Reunion, <laughs> um, who would attend. Um, there is someone, oh, about effective versus cognitive empathy. Thank you, um, Chelsea. So um, this is going to be a really bastardized um, um, definition, and I apologize. I um, probably should Google instead of just going off the top of my head. But so there are different, when you're looking at empathy, there are different ways of kind of measuring it. And so there can be um, cognitive empathy is Basically, you have the ability to think about what it's like to be person A and put yourself in their shoes. So what it's like to have your parents get divorced or to be in a car accident, like you, you can feel like you're that person. You can feel like what they were dealing with and what they were going through. And that's how you, um, you can kind of like imagine. Whereas some people cannot, like I cannot, um, if I haven't been through something and I don't have anything to relate it to, it's very challenging for me to have any kind of understanding of what it's like for someone else. I might know that it's bad or that's sad, but I can't relate. I can't find a way, you know, I can't, um, I, I can't. And so sometimes we handle those things poorly. Like we try to um, change the subject or we joke out of it. We talk about something we went through or we don't, if we don't display the emotion that people, or it might take a while for us to understand. So like we're impacted like by, mood or sadness or things that happen um but we but it isn't because we can quote unquote relate it is because when we feel it if we feel something similar we we are you know sympathize with them and so because of that you know because of not having that cognitive aspect of it it's like it, you know someone has had a death in the family and um, whereas other people can relate we can't relate we know it's bad we know it's sad but we can't really know what it's like if we haven't been through that um, and I know that's not the greatest example, and I apologize, um, but I hope it did help some. <laughs> and then there's a question about um, CCS being a more accommodating environment for difference. What recommend recommendations that you can have for students in more traditional classrooms? Um, I think that there's a number of things. So um, one thing that I really like is um, if people kind of normalize some of these things. So instead of making it something that the disabled person needs, 
you know, make it like, for example, do you have w- different ways that people can turn things in? Like, okay, you can use a Dropbox or you can email or you can put this here, you can turn this in. You know, when you review the, the syllabus, instead of just reading the generic boilerplate um, description <laughs> that's there about disability, maybe give some practical examples or do or accommodate yourself in front of others. Um, you know, like for example, I have sh- certain shoes that I wear in the in the classroom setting that I change into. Um, I have my my um, blinds open and my lights off, like so people. And I, I tell people, don't give me anything. Do not hand that paper to me. You will get a zero. I have no executive functioning. Put it in the basket. You know, so um, a kind of modeling it as well, and then in examples as much as one can, drawing in different examples to kind of show different experiences. Um, people uh, and allowing people to, you know, so I guess just trying to think and also asking people what they might need. Because it's interestingly enough, when I worked in K through 12, the majority of students who used, I had like a sensory basket on my desk. I had where people could get a sensory break if you needed to have like, a, there was a little, um, sand, I forgot what those things are called, that you flip over, you know, where you can have a certain amount of time. And so as long as you're quiet, you could get up and walk or move around. Um, You could have um, a pair of clean socks that you kept in a basket and change into those. I had some bean bags. So I had all these different things and that were that I had in the room and the majority of the students who used these things like who you know the bouncing ball or whatever were not the disabled students it was beneficial for everyone um and so you know so I think we really just kind of need to change like I think a lot of some of the things we do now like for example when I was growing up everybody said boys and girls now people say you know you know guests or family you know they don't assume everyone's a boy or girl or they'll just say he or she they'll say you know they'll default to maybe they if you don't know who it is um instead of making assumptions and so I think those are things the dsm language is very problematic it's getting better but i think one of the areas that's been slow to change is that people say that well this is accurate um, or this is you know but a lot of things have been accurate we've evolved over times we don't call people um we don't say people have our, our mongoloids we say down syndrome we don't say mentally retarded we say intellectual disability um my birth certificate says negro no one goes around calling me negro <laughs> you know what i mean like anymore we can evolve we can change um and i think that that people are uncomfortable doing so because they get accustomed to a word, but when the word does not harm you, you know, when the word seems to you, you know, I think any any term that we use, if it's not neutral, it's problematic. You know, I I grew up when they had steward and stewardess and waiter and waitress. And, you know, and so I remember being so happy when it turned to server and flight attendant and firefighter, because I remember feeling so erased by all of the school books that all assumed all of these things that men did this and women did this. Um, and it just made me so happy when it was you know, not the case. And so I think that with disability as well, I think a lot of people um, feel are not seen or heard because of the way we structure li- our you know, society. And I, I don't think that that's right. There's a lot of privilege that we have built in, myself being right-handed, my son and my brother are left-handed. They, um, I know we do need to go. Um, they have those same experiences as well. Um, Thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, You know, you learn about the privilege that you have and how different it is. And you just, we can learn and improve. Thank you so much, Marena Kay, for your fantastic presentation and your very insightful answers to our questions. Thank you. Um, I would like everybody to please join us on October 11th from 1130 to 1230 for our next DEI lecture series speaker, Tawana Petty, who will discuss art and social justice. Uh, Tawana is a part of Petty Propolis, a Black woman-led art in- artist incubator, primarily focused on cultivating visionary resistance through poetry, literacy, or literacy, literary workshops, anti-racism facilitation, and social justice initiatives. Thank you, everybody, so much, and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much, Marina Kay. Thank you. Um, absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.